The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, curses, hexes, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep that results from listening to this podcast. This is the Scream Kings podcast. I'm Max George. I'm Nathaniel Darkish. You're going to need a bigger podcast. All right. Well, today we have a very uh, different sort of treat for you guys. I have been thinking a lot lately about, like, what would be the perfect horror movie for today? You know, right now we're in the middle of still dealing with COVID-19. And, you know, we, I, I think we kind of took a little bit of a stab at this earlier in the year with our episodes uh, about Rack and Rack 2. I do think we need to make mention COVID-19 is not the only thing happening in 2020. <laughs> oh, no, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, but, but, you know, I, I've just been spending a lot of time really thinking about what, what it's been like, you know, being quarantined and then not being quarantined anymore and how kind of scary that is, and, and a lot of the political situation in the world, and, and the things politicians are wanting that the people necess- don't necessarily agree with. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a weird time, and, and I've come to the conclusion that I know the perfect horror movie for, for this time. Mm. And da, 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 you know from the da, 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 da. I was it just is... giving you a, an intro with fake drums. <laughs> ah, ah. Well, I, I thought you were going to go, you know, more the bottom. Um, yeah, the... <laughs> da, 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 da. yeah, it's Jaws. Um, <laughs> Jaws is a perfect COVID movie. It is as if God created the devil and gave him Jaws. <laughs> Sharks, virus, it's all the same, really. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm sure uh, some of you uh, out there listening are raising your eyebrows and going, what is he talking about? How is Jaws at all related to the state of the world? But uh, we'll get into that. But first, let's just do kind of a brief recap of the movie uh, so we can you know, maybe provide some, some context before we jump into my uh, crazy connections here. So Jaws is a fairly simple story. It's basically man versus shark, right? Wonderful beach community uh, called Amity Island that relies heavily on, you know, the, the kind of tourist economy of people coming to the beach uh, is dealing with a uh, killer shark. Uh, you know, the, the movie starts with a young woman swimming naked, all titillatingly, and then a, a shark comes and, you know, takes a, a big old bite. And that is just the beginning of the, the reign of terror. You know, we, there are, our main hero is the sheriff, Chief Brody. And then, you know, he ends up getting backed up. The best character. Brody oh, is for the sure. best. For sure. And, and, you know, he ultimately teams up with Cooper, who is a marine biologist, and then a local uh, seaman named Quint. And they, they take on the shark. But this is, you know, after multiple shark attacks, attempts to try to shut down the beaches that keep getting denied. Basically, the, the shark kills way too many people because things go wrong. You know, but ultimately, they, uh, the, the three, uh, Brody, Quint, and Hooper, all go out into the, the ocean uh, on uh, Quint's boat. And they, you know, chum the waters until they finally take on the shark and kill it with uh, Quint dying in the, in the middle of the action. And then, you know, credits roll as, as Brody and Hooper swim to shore. He's not, af- and he's not afraid of water anymore. Can't forget that awesome quote. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's line, I guess. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, obviously the, the story's not just quite that simple. There's, you know, there's, yeah, these, these kind of, you know, interesting character arcs, you know, we have Brody who, in spite of living on an Island, 
uh, really just yeah doesn't like the water ever since his childhood. You know he's he's more of a you know he he's more content just being on the beach if if approaching the water at all to, for the, for that matter. And then you know we have Hooper who is very knowledgeable but very inexperienced. And then we have you know Quint who who kind of has to to learn to maybe interact with other people a little bit more and rely on other people when he's used to being the the loner who goes and just takes care of stuff himself. So, you know, we we have a lot here. But before we get into all of the the great things that make up this movie, should we should I dig a little bit more into my connection here between this and Gobit? Yeah, and before you dive into that, I I think some of the legacy behind Jaws is about what you're going to talk about here, Nathaniel, is at its core, it is kind of a monster movie about this, you know, crazy giant shark that's murdering people. But there's a lot of more kind of realistic horror in terms of what is going on because of the shark, the, the politics behind this, and what do people do, and yada yada, and... And really, I think that gives credence to why Jaws sticks around. I mean, this is one of Spielberg's greatest movies, in my opinion. It came out in 75, and it's it's ubiquitous. You can't hear that music without associating it with Jaws. Uh, that music is everywhere now. And, and again, I think it's because of these kind of underlying tones within the movie that are just so universally true, unfortunately. And dive into it, pun intended, um, ah. if you will. <laughs> okay, so... So yeah, the, the big thing that I see that makes Jaws the perfect COVID-19 horror movie is really, yeah, dealing with, with the politics that are going on in town. You know, we have this town that, yeah, as I mentioned in, in the synopsis, relies on people coming in and spending money for this, this town to stay alive. And so we have a mayor who knows that there's a dangerous shark and chooses to not let uh, Chief Brody, time and time again, shut down the beaches, no matter how hard he asks, no, no matter what he does, he fights him, you know, tooth and nail every step of the way, and that gets more people killed. If this feels familiar, that's for a good reason. You know, we, we have a, a time now where we have a life-threatening disease, and, and a the, the best solution to prevent more deaths is to shut everything down and continue to quarantine until the, the numbers go down. And, and you know, we see many instances of, of places in the world where that happened and it, and it went away and now they're back to business as usual. New Zealand comes to mind. But in, in uh, America and, and also several other major countries, but you know, most notably in America, I mean, that's what's affecting us directly as uh, as we're both, you know, from uh, the United States here. But, yeah, we have politicians prioritizing the economy and, you know, ultimately just the almighty dollar over human lives. And it, it's, it's, it feels like this, this film in many ways is so prophetic uh, about the ways that, that that connects. But, I mean, but the thing is, I don't, I don't think it is necessarily like a prophetic film. It's, it's, it's the perfect film for COVID-19 because it's the perfect film for so many different points in time where, yeah, the economy and money is more important than human lives. And, and that, unfortunately, is just a, a, uni a universal American truth. I was just going to say, I think even one step further, I think this movie it dissects a lot of the political facade that you have these people who are powerhouses and, you know, making laws and governing people. And these events will happen. And I, I agree with you. I don't think this movie is, you know, exclusively for COVID. It has a much greater impact when it comes to politicians. But I love the way Spielberg treated the mayor because he inherently wasn't necessarily a bad guy. And he's not wholly he was, wrong. Right. He just was so afraid of losing his reputation and his control and you know the public's view of him that led him to do some incredibly awful things i mean which caused the death of people and we see it now we're seeing it right now so please go vote november 3rd <laughs> go register to vote uh, i didn't think this would turn into a, a voting campaign podcast i'll take that one step further 
the if if you want to dive into the just bonkers sequels to Jaws with with Jaws two, the mayor is still the mayor. Please vote and and don't just vote on the national scale. Vote in your local elections too, because garbage Agreed. politicians get reelected even after crap like this. Please don't make that true in this case in 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 this economy in in this world that that we're living in. Along those lines. Uh, Another thing I wanted to point out that yeah, it kind of shows this connection in, in, I think, a really interesting way is that the mayor isn't the person who gets attacked necessarily for the the deaths. I mean, you know, we as the audience know that he's the one that is really the one at fault. But it's interesting to see that the person who actually, like, literally uh, takes some damage... You know, he has a, a the mother of the little boy who who dies comes up and slaps uh, him in the face. Is Chief Brody? You know, it's it's his fault, right? You know, it's like you knew that it wasn't safe and you didn't close the beaches. And I, I found that very poignant because you know he wasn't allowed to. You know, it really wasn't his fault. And and so it, you know, tying it to today, you know, people like Fauci who are trying to protect us. Uh, often end up having death threats against their family every day and things like that, where they're taking a lot of damage, even though they're the ones who are trying to protect people. And so it just feels very poignant in a way that if this movie came out now, I would say people would say, this is way too on the nose as, as political commentary. I don't like it. But yeah, so so that's why I think that this is such a, a poignant uh, example of a great film for our day, even... 45 years after it came out. Things haven't changed, everybody. Putting all of the political gravitas aside for a minute, not that it's not important and we need to move on because it's a message that everyone needs to hear right now, especially with an election almost a month away. Um, this is just a damn good movie. Right? Uh, that, m- that message is first and foremost very apparent from start to finish. But you peel that back and holy moly, guys, if you haven't seen Jaws, you're not, yeah, you don't even know what you're missing. It's, it's amazing. And I think what we talked a little bit about the opening of the movie, we have this naked lady swimming in the ocean, the music, the environment, it, it feels almost ethereal. And then that kind of lovely vision is shattered with the attack of jaws and right there it kind of misleads your senses and i don't even know how to describe it it's just a beautiful setup spielberg and his editor at the time just really knew what they were doing this film launched spielberg's career because not not because it was necessarily just a, a fun great movie that that drew people in that certainly helped but you know, he he made this movie work when, like, the book it was based off was kind of trashy. Like, you know, he 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 <laughs> elevated it. He brought such depth to the filmmaking process, and and he assembled a great team of actors. And you know, he brought in John Williams, who just killed it with the music. He, you know, his yeah, his whole his whole crew really brought their A game and, you know, made a, a high quality movie, even though like, yeah, kind of at its surface it's it's not that deep. Or at least it it shouldn't be that deep. You know, most other movies that are like this, like the the eight million sequels and you know, rip off movies. The Meg. The Meg you know, yeah, yeah, we still have them now. Yeah, we have the Meg, but you know, at the time we had Piranha. You know, we had, you know, so many different things that none of them have the same level of high caliber filmmaking and thoughtfulness i think that that jaws has coupled with the amazing movie and kind of the scene and the message is that the actors are so so dedicated to their craft i mean roy schneider is brody robert shaw is quint richard dreyfus is hooper uh, it all that they all you could tell were just they could almost feel the magic of the movie, and I think we've talked a little bit about this phenomenon in other episodes that we've recorded of that the actors know I think that they're part of something special. You can almost kind of feel it radiating off of their performance in some way. Um, and I know that sounds very metaphysical and magical, but it, it, it's a vibe that you get watching them that they become these 
characters they're portraying, and you don't see that often in movies, I think. And I think a lot of that comes down to, you know, Spielberg being such a, a talented director, because, you know, you could tell that, you know, when, when actors are giving performances this good, that, that tends to mean that they're getting good direction. They know what he wants and what, you know, is going to translate well to the screen. And so, yeah, like, you know, we, we and, and I, I like that the, the cast is kind of a, a mix of, you know, at the time, you know, some, some very experienced veterans, you know, like Robert Shaw had been, a, you know, in, in the film industry for years. But then this was like Dreyfus's like second big movie. And, you know, he's gone on to, to be in many, many movies. But like this, you know, he so so Spielberg, you know, really brought the best out of, uh, you know, a relative newbie actor. And also a really, you know, seasoned veteran. And and even though those two actors didn't get along uh and you know, behind the scenes, he, he got them to he, he used that dynamic to work with the, within the film and you know, like the, the tension that is between the characters felt very authentic because he lets the the reality of it come in, in a natural way without having them literally just like, you know, I don't know, get in a fist fight on you know, in front of the camera or something. Um, and something I read earlier today when I was researching Jaws a little bit more was Spielberg also, the movie was filmed in Martha's Vineyard, if I'm not mistaken. And a lot of the background characters and additional characters they used were just kind of locals in the area, which brought a level of authenticity again to the movie. These people were familiar with the area. They dressed in what the area was dressing like. It's just a whole other level of perfection that Spielberg really was able to capture, I think. And I think as we've discussed, this movie is clearly timeless. If we can draw such strong connections and relatability to, you know, like we mentioned, years later, and you think of the music that John Williams crafted for this movie. It, it, you can't hear that and not kind of look behind your back a little bit and, and feel that that kind of ominous vibe to it. It's it's given life to a soundtrack in a horror movie. A horror movie soundtrack is iconic now. And I think that is just a beautiful testament to the power and the... Uh, oh, I don't even know. I'm raving. <laughs> it's so yeah. good. Well, I mean, yeah, like John Williams is, is a brilliant, brilliant composer. But what I, what I love is that what he brought to the table for this movie isn't like a, a typical monster movie kind of soundtrack. Like a lot of the everyday stuff feels very normal John Williams kind of stuff. Very, you know, brassy and fun and, you know, pretty light. Kind of like, I would say like light classical fare. But then when we have the moments of danger, like we instantly know. And and that, you know, the, the way that it kind of plays off of the, you know, the, the way that the shark slowly you know, approaches, and, you know, it goes past, and then it comes past again. Like, it, the fact that it mirrors the behavior of the shark in such an interesting way, and, and then, you know, just feels like it fits so well, I, I love. But, that, you know, and I love that that doesn't sound like other horror movie soundtracks. It wasn't just, you know, like screechy violins that are, you know, creating a false sense of tension. It was just that the the deep powerful brass gets gets you know bigger and bigger and more intense and faster as it as it as the threat looms there are other moments when there's no music and this trifecta of knowing when to incorporate the musical addition i think again really provides a level of art that you just sometimes don't see anymore in movies nowadays uh, and it aids, you know, the shark, the monster of the movie. It kind of elevates him to this new level of horror monster. He will go down in history as something on par with Dracula, Frankenstein, Invisible Man. These creatures that we've had for years and years and years now have a new buddy in Jaws. It's just, it's so unparalleled how perfect this movie is sometimes <laughs> yeah it, it, it really is uncanny the the level of skill that that spielberg brought to the table you know so early in the in his career one thing that that you know we have in our notes is just that it also just had such a, a powerful cultural impact um and and this ends up being incidentally in some ways one of the cons of the film 
in that, you know, this movie scared people out of the water. It, it actually had a very adverse effect on, like, the people going to the beach for a couple of years after it came out. And also for, the, for a few years after it came out, just so many sharks were just killed, like, senselessly. And so, like, that, that, that's a, that, that both is a testament to the power of the movie and, and how effective it is and, and how well-crafted it is. But it, unfortunately, yeah, provoked a lot of very uh, real-life terror in a way that made people do some stupid stuff. But, but it still, like, brings that level of terror even to, like, new audiences. Like, there's reasons that people still will have, like, like, pools will still have special, like, showings of it where you can watch it in the pool, which I want to do sometime, because that would be a blast. And I guess, yeah, you have a story about one of your siblings? Um, yeah, just going back to kind of the level of fear that this movie can create. One, I, I was watching an interview with Spielberg today when the movie first dropped in 1975, and he was talking about one of his favorite things to do was go to a theater that was first showing the movie and just watch the audience. And he said that there were sometimes people would get up and run out of the movie theater and just vomit because they were so afraid and now i think the movie isn't quite as scary as it may have been back in 1975 but a, a fun story i have a little sister who when she first saw this movie i was probably junior high she must have been in elementary school our dad showed it to us and she refused not only to go swimming and we lived fairly close to a public swimming pool every summer we'd walk there every day but she was terrified that there was going to be this shark that was going to come out of the swimming pool grate and just eat everybody <laughs> and also she stopped bathing for a little bit because she was afraid a shark was going to come out of the drain in the tub and eat her i used to when i was a kid uh, I would sometimes get into the deep end of a pool and I would have the thought, what if there was a shark in here? And then over the next few minutes of being in the deep end, that thought would, uh, gradually congeal to fuck me. There is a <laughs> shark in here. So Justin, the fact that you could see through the water didn't do anything. Don't matter. Don't, Don't matter. matter. He was behind me. He's a voice. He's made of glass. Me. Glass shark. Glass shark. <laughs> Uh, this is the same sibling who my sister hid under her bed and made the grudge noise while she slept. She hid yeah. under her bed for a good 20, 30 minutes until she was almost asleep and started making those noises. So she's traumatized for life. It's fine. But that is the caliber that this movie can scare people into. And like you said, it has some drawbacks. I, I don't think the movie is inherently anti-shark or kill all the sharks. Oh, it's not, people for sure. People became so damn afraid that that's what it led to. And I just, if that's not a horror movie, then what is? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and what I find so funny is that, like, people try to, I, I think some people, like, take issue with this idea that Jaws is, like, a horror movie. Like, oh, no, it's a thriller. No, it's a, uh, you know, whatever. Okay, I'm going to get on a little, uh, little pulpit for just a second. Just because something is a di or is another genre as well does not mean that it isn't horror. This is actually a, a conversation I recently have had a few times uh, with a coworker of mine about Alien, where he's like, "Well, I just feel like it's a it's a sci-fi movie, not really a horror movie." I'm like, "It's both things. It could be both things." You know, it, people create this weird false dichotomy where things have to be one thing or a different thing. It could be two things. This is my favorite analogy to relate this to. A sandwich is not only peanut butter and jelly. You can have a ham and cheese. You can have a Monte Cristo. You can have a French dip. They're all sandwiches. They're just different flavors of sandwiches. And that's the same with horror movies. And we've talked about this way back in the beginning when we started. Just because something is a thriller or a psychological thriller automatically negate that it can be horror and yep. probably is horror. And I, I laugh anytime someone tells me they don't like horror because they don't do demons and paranormal stuff and ghosts, but they love a good movie about a serial killer because that's more of a thriller than anything. And I'm like, you can go to hell and meet me there. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's just one of those things where, yeah, people, 
so many people are so uncomfortable with with the word horror. It makes them squirm. And and I think that's just so backwards, unfortunately, because people pigeonhole horror as one single thing. Oh, it's it's just slashers. It's just uh, haunted house sh- movies, that kind of thing. And it's like, no, horror is everything from Jaws to Alien to Silence of the Lambs to trashy B movies with mutants running around. You know, horror can be a million different things, and it can be more than one thing at once. You know, with a with a horror comedy, a, a great example to me is Shaun of the Dead, where it is, I would say, you know, it's more comedy than a horror movie, but it doesn't change the fact that it is a horror movie because it's about zombies, and because there are there is a scene where a man gets torn apart and has all of his intestines ripped up by zombies, and it's very graphic and gruesome and horrifying. It's both things. Just because something makes you laugh doesn't mean it that that it's now no longer a scary thing as well and just because something has a moment of scare doesn't mean that it's not that that you can't laugh at it anymore it's you know things are more complicated and nuanced than we let them be you know people create this false dichotomy that things can only fit within one category and that's dumb and, you know, Jaws isn't just a thriller and not just a horror movie. It's also a blockbuster. And so, you know, that's something I, I think is also really fun, is that this movie created the summer blockbuster. Very famously did that. And so it's really kind of fun to see, and especially, like, you know, think about this movie in, in a year where we kind of don't have any summer blockbusters. Not really. We have one, uh, two maybe, you know, Tenet and New Mutants, I guess. Yeah, like, this movie created... The, the sort of cultural phenomenon of going to the movies in the summertime and, you know, having these big budget, glossy, action packed, fun, crazy movies as, as the norm. You know, without this movie, we wouldn't have 8 million Marvel movies and Batman movies and super crazy action movies that, that we have constantly. This kind of gave permission for the movie genre to do that. I think we underestimate, and I think in COVID times, we can appreciate that a little bit more, that I think our generation, Nathaniel, is so accustomed to, oh, what's coming out this summer? What's coming out this fall? There's always something coming. And and like you say, without Jaws, we wouldn't have that excitement. And without COVID, we wouldn't have it either. But here we are. Yeah. I think kind of the last two things we should probably talk about is, I know you have some feelings about the novel. Um, But before we get there, again, I think the mastercraft of Spielberg with the shark is that we don't see it in full until the very, very end. We see moments, we see glimpses, but we're not exposed to it in its entirety until the third and final act. And you and I have talked ad nauseum about how powerful this can be in horror movies and Mm. how dangerous it can be in horror movies. If you do it too soon, you're going to ruin the movie. If you don't do it soon enough, you're going to ruin the movie. And Jaws is just, it's a perfect tease that leads to such, such a beautiful reward. Uh, Well, and and something I I find so fascinating about it is that Spielberg kind of just stumbled upon the perfect formula because that's kind of what he had to do because the stupid mechanical shark wouldn't work right. And so he couldn't show it very much because if he did, it would just look bad. You know, he he had to do it to hide how clunky the, the, you know, how how it kept breaking down and just not working right and moving its jaws weird. And so he had to do that. And then just, you know, because that was the necessity, it ended up working out better than I'm sure if if the shark was working how he wanted and he showed it a whole bunch. Yeah, and I have a few more things to say about Robot Shark, but let's hear you talk about the book. Okay, so the book... uh, you know, this is this is based on a book that came out just a couple of years before the movie uh, by Peter Benchley. And for the most part, a lot of the major beats are the same. You know, we have Sheriff Brody, is the, or sorry, Chief Brody is the main character. You know, we have Hooper, we have Quint, we have, you know, all of the, the same kind of major pieces. You know, this is, this is one of the, the big examples for me of a movie being better than the book. And the reason that the movie is better than the book is because it took things from the book that didn't really belong in the story, that that really took away from the story. 
it omitted the unnecessary things that were kind of just there to make it a trashy beach read. You know, the 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 book has a very major subplot about Cooper having an affair with Ellen Brody. So Chief Brody's wife gets it on with Hooper. Um, you know, they, they have some torrid affair at some motel ne- nearby. And it's all there for really no reason other than just because, I don't know, Peter eventually wanted to throw some sex in the book and make it a little bit more titillating. And if you're going to have sex in the book, it should contribute in some way to the story, but it doesn't. It it just really kind of made it very, I don't know, I felt like it flattened the characters in a way where them working together to take on the shark at the end became almost just like a, a machismo contest between the two of them. Like, hey, well, I'm going to be the one who takes on the shark. No, I'm going to be the one who takes on the shark because I'm, you know, I, I'm going to win my woman back. Oh, no, I'm going to win over your woman permit. Like, it was, it was that kind of like stupid trashy nonsense that... I, I I just, it, it felt like it was just giving me a headache when I read it. I was like, really? This is in this book? Like, why is this so, like, why is this stupid plotline 30% of the book? And so, you know, by cutting that out and really making it much more sincere and, and allowing the, the characters to have their own arcs in much more realistic, fleshed out ways where, you know, we, we get to experience their plot arcs outside of just, you know, stereotypical male posturing, it made it for a much more sincere, worthwhile film. Well, and I think it, it undermines, like you say, a lot of the character development that we see in the movie. Um, those three main characters, the trifecta of Jaws, really kind of come together and overcome a lot of biases that they have. And it, it, you root for all three of them and identify for identify with any one of them at any part in the movie and to sort of throw in kind of this uh, superfluous sex element to it yeah i agree i think trashy beach read is an excellent term that we need to use more oh it gets used a lot in the literary world it just undermines character growth when instead of overcoming obstacles, you're fighting for a woman, you know, and it makes the woman into a prize or an object. And it just, it pulls away from the authenticity, I think. Yeah, well, and, and another thing is like, yeah, like, Ellen Brody isn't very significant, you know, like, like she, she has a good relationship with her husband. Um, I like, you know, the moments where you see his fi- family dynamic and show like kind of what he's fighting for here. And, you know, I, like, I like that, that it shows that they have, like, a good romantic life. You know, hey, you want to get drunk and fool around? You know, stuff like that Those are, are fun, very sincere lines that, that really work for me in the movie. Like, making her just, like, just kind of, like, at, at the drop of a hat, too, like, have, have this affair. Where it's basically, like, uh, Hooper comes over for dinner once, and then, like, I don't know, the next day they're just, you know, banging against the walls in the motel room. And you're like, really? Like... It just, it, it felt like Peter Benchley got bored and was imagining his character is really hot. So, well, you know, let's just have someone have sex with her. Well, let's not talk about sex <laughs> and talk about cons of the movie. That was a song, if you didn't catch that. Mm. Mm. Let's talk about, well, we probably shouldn't say that because then we'll owe them royalties. <laughs> yeah, let, let's, let's steer clear of that. So I already brought up the, the con of, People, unfortunately, killing so many sharks after this. So we can uh, just move on to the other one thing that I had. Do do you agree with this, that that the end is a little bit cheesy? Yes and no. I watched a really good kind of mock, not mockumentary, documentary as I was working today about this ending scene with the gas tank that was put into the shark's mouth. They shoot the tank and it explodes. Um, The explosion was gorific and beautiful. We just have to say that (laughs) (laughs) the science of it all. I I don't know if that would actually happen, which no, it would not. It would not at all. I watched Mythbusters, (laughs) which is disappointing because I think Spielberg did such a good job at not allowing us to need to dispend belief. Like all of the events up to that point 
could happen in some capacity. Maybe not in the capacity of a giant shark terrorizing the town, but sharks do kill people on occasion. Paranoia happens, politicians happen. The documentary, though, I watched really focused up on Spielberg's manipulation of the tank. It wasn't this very big foreshadowed thing at the beginning of the movie, which then led to the end of the movie. It wasn't this cyclical kind of resolution. We saw the tanks and they were part of kind of the third act. And so it was a very subtle way to lead us to that resolution. Although I agree with you, killing the shark with an oxygen tank exploding seemed really kind of dumb. (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah just to me it's it's one of those things where it just one yeah it's just bad science uh and i think largely kind of created the normal thing of of every action movie from from there on out having someone shoot a gas tank and it blow up dramatically so i think that's a little bit unfortunate but also yeah just like to me that wasn't the interesting thing like i think maybe what would have worked better for me personally would be if you know Brody had to get into the water more to fight him, you know, instead of just you know kind of climbing back and shoving it into his mouth and then shooting it. If he had to face his fear of the water a little bit more directly in order to kill it, you know, if 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 you know the shark is up and then you know he has to jump into the water and like stab it in the side or something, that would have worked better for me. Um, just, you know, as, as a viewer and kind of looking at his, his the, the arc of his fear getting really fully resolved. I don't know. It, like, it doesn't have to be that specifically, but just, I don't know. Yeah, it just, it felt like a, a very convenient, like, oh, and, and, and everything is insurmountable. Oh, 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 and uh, let's shoot a gas tank in its mouth. Boom, it's dead. Roll credits. Yeah, and I think the, f- if I remember right, the first time I watched Jaws, I, I was young, and I remember that, and it was like, oh. It's over? That's it? (laughs) It it just... I don't know. It felt disjointed when the entire rest of the movie was just so fluid and beautiful. Um, That's about all I can say, though, when it comes to bad aspects of the movie. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's my whole list. It's it's a pretty freaking perfect movie otherwise. So, do you want some Um, trivia? So, I do. I have one that I really enjoyed as well. Okay. Um... How about you go first? Uh, So the documentary I watched, uh, it made mention that Spielberg, of course, had this robot shark, and the media dropped to the news that it was a robot shark, and he was livid because he thought that this was going to ruin the magic of the movie, and I just thought that was awesome that they tried to keep it as tight of a secret as possible. It didn't work. And he took that very harshly, very personal. I I just don't think we see that in movies nowadays, and I think a large part of that is CGI um, and the internet, honestly. I just think it shows, again, the art and the mastercraft of Spielberg wanting to protect his movie to that degree. Uh, You know, the special effects behind his monster was ruined, therefore he's concerned that the movie won't be as good. My my trivia is, is... Largely uh, more just kind of fun little silly tidbits. So, uh, fun fact that the shark's name uh, on set was Bruce. Also, apparently Spielberg, when he started, when when Bruce wasn't working right, uh, also referred to him as the Great White Turd. <laughs> but yeah, so if if a shark named Bruce sounds familiar from Oh Say Finding Nemo, that was actually a tribute to Jaws. Another thing is uh, the you're going to need a bigger boat line, which we so lovingly ripped off at the beginning of the episode, uh, was improvised. So that's fun. It's just you know such an iconic line. I love it when you know actors just you know kind of find a, a great thing to throw in it, that that ends up being so powerful and iconic. Uh, and then also uh, that whole like really dramatic speech that Quint gives uh, near the end, where he's you know like telling. The, the stories about like surviving the the acts uh, you know yeah him, his his really intense scary real life story that he uh, of what he had survived that kind of you know ultimately brings all the the three of them together more so apparently the actor was supposed to be drinking fake booze 
but he smuggled real booze on, and so that take that, that, that you watch there is him just plastered out of his mind. I mean, honestly, that that makes so much sense. <laughs> I, I think it adds a level of authenticity to that speech. Yes. That is just glorious. Because <laughs> it's just iconic, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love that, too. And, and yeah, apparently, like, it was so bad that, like, between takes, like, he would just, like, fall asleep. And they have to, like, shake him awake. And be like, okay, you have to do this. And he's like, what's my lines again? <laughs> and, like... And so they, they were going to have to walk him through it. And so, like, yeah, a lot, a lot of it was, like, he just kind of got the very basic gist, but didn't deliver the lines as they were written. He kind of did it his own meandering way because he was too drunk to remember the real lines, and he just didn't care. And But, yeah, they didn't want to have to do another day of shooting just, you know, with kind of how things had panned out. And so they're like, ah, oh, screw it. Let's just, you know, like, let, let's let him do it drunk and see how it goes. And it ended up working out great. Um, so that's fun. <laughs> that's brilliant. And then just the last thing is, have you seen any of the sequels, or have you heard anything about the sequels? Because they're bonkers. Yeah, I've seen two and three, and I, they're just nuts, nuts. Yeah. I mean, like, like, like two is just like a kind of a stupid rehashing of one, and I, I was shocked at how many people from the original film like were in it. You know, like, like they, they, they kept like most of the main cast. Uh, I mean, you know. Or at least most of the characters that are in the second one were played with the same character, or same actors, which is pretty impressive, honestly. That that they somehow managed to pull that off. Um, because that doesn't usually happen with with sequels like that. But yeah, like three is crazy. It's like here, here's a thirty foot shark at Sea World, and all sorts of crazy stuff. And it's it's uh, Brody's kids that have to take it on. And just and 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 then the fourth one is uh, some shark is following. Brody's wife after Brody has died, and it's just it's crazy. It's crazy. Like, why would you make a sequel to Jaws? It's stupid. There's an inherent value in watching them as trashy movies that you make fun of, but, like, unless you're, like, doing something like going Mystery Science Theater on it, or, like, I don't know, doing a drinking game or something, if, if that's your thing, I don't see why anyone even went and saw them. So, should we move on to ratings? Yeah. Um so as far as screams go, there are some really good scares here. One in particular with the head, the jump scare in the ocean, like that will forever be one of the most iconic jump scares of Max's life of all time. Yeah, the the one that leads to the you you're going to need a bigger boat line. But aside from that, it is a scary movie, but it's more it didn't ever terrify me like a hereditary did or make me stop watching horror movies for three or four days like the evil dead remake <laughs> it's scary but in a different way so i gave it a four i gave it a four as well like that's that's basically my thoughts exactly it's what when it does scares it does them very well but they are few and far between yeah for sure uh so for crowns i gave it a nine because uh, it is a near perfect movie but just the fact that, that the thing I don't love about it is at the very, like, climax conclusion of the film yep. is, is honestly what made it drop a point for me. Otherwise, I don't think it would have, you know, if, if I had some, that small of a complaint about it earlier in the film, would not have even affected the score. It would have been a perfect 10. But it's a, it's a 9 for me. I think this is one of those magical moments, Nathaniel, where we agree. Completely. <laughs> Completely. I'm going to put some sort of, like, beautiful <laughs> swelling score here <laughs> oh wow oh that's awesome yeah so nine for me on crowns and like you said it it's almost poetic it, as far as a movie goes the art behind it is just so well done and then right at the end we have to dispend belief and you're just kind of like oh man <laughs> okay so i'm curious where does this rank for you among oh, Spielberg's movies. Well, you just write Poltergeist, and now I can't decide. So, Well, well, okay, so, so to be fair, Poltergeist was Toby Hooper who directed True. it. True, right. But it was Spielberg written and produced, and apparently he also did maybe did, did a little bit of directing, too, because he could, just couldn't stay away, even though he was supposed to be working on E.T. So, as a kid, I wanted to be a film director, and Spielberg is probably in my top five I love Spielberg to death. I think he's a master at what he does. The movies he creates are beautiful. I struggled putting this 
in a list because I have Hook, Ready Player One, Close Encounters, um, Schindler's List, E.T., like you said, Poltergeist. All of these movies meant so much to me as a kid, minus Ready Player One. That one came out fairly recently. I don't know. It's high up there. Oh, and Indiana Jones and Jurassic Park. Like, it's in its own caliber of movies. That I, I just can't rate it. It's in this lofty little treasure box of Max's, some of Max's favorite movies that I just don't want to. It's like that top 10 Facebook friends list we used to have, where if you moved someone out of that list, they would get very offended. Um, I, I don't want to touch my Spielberg movies. It, it's high up there as far as favorite movies go, and that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> well, so, well, can you just tell me what your very favorite is? If, if you have Probably one. Close Encounters. Yes! Um, my, my parents took us to Devil's Tower in Wyoming, and my dad would not shut up about Close Encounters, and none of us had seen it. And this tower in Wyoming was just so intimidating and stunning and so when we got home i remember this so vividly that we had this like mashed potato dinner and kind of recreated the meal that they have in the movie and then my dad something this is important yeah it means something we say that all the time in my family it's just i don't know if it's as action-packed as some of other spielbergs but close encounters to me is one of those movies like return of the jedi that i just associate with my father and it means so much to me because of that uh, yeah, see, I would say Close Encounters is my number one as well. See, we're just on the same page today. This is, this is what is what is happening? <laughs> Are we best friends again? I think I think the trauma of the thing has finally worn off, and now we're healing, Nathaniel. We're healing. <laughs> see, Jaws Jaws is also the perfect COVID movie because it can bring people together. Also, Aww. Close Encounters apparently. Seriously, Close Encounters is such a freaking great movie. and I, Okay, yeah. now we have to do Close Encounters. Yeah, because it's definitely a sci-fi movie, but it definitely has some strong horror elements. And we should also <laughs> just go to Devil's Tower together, because it's not that far. No, it I've isn't. Never been. And it's, it's mind-blowing, Nathaniel. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So now, <laughs> now we have uh, a bro uh, trip planned, and a uh, future episode. Before we stop the podcast so we can figure all of that out uh how are you staying spooky these days um i've had a wonderful wonderful chance to be a guest on another kind of horror ish podcast it's called the fudgel cast podcast you can find them on spotify itunes wherever you listen um it's a group of queer individuals who kind of didn't have anything better to do during quarantine and decided to start a podcast and it's kind of taken off and i met one of the hosts on a dating app because apparently that's how my life runs now <laughs> um, and he invited me to be on the show and we talked for almost two hours about how i got into horror and such a wonderful time definitely take a listen to that when it drops it should be around halloween we'll we'll, we'll put that on all of our social media absolutely probably even more special was i was asked to be a voice actor on monsters out of the closet podcast which are big fans of the show we support them dearly on twitter and the creators are going through some really hard times so if you like horror podcasts um if you're queer if you're an ally check them out they do some incredible stuff all of their content is stories or art created by queer people uh which is then rebroadcasted through their podcast with voice actors such as myself uh, so i had the opportunity to be a voice actor on a very very special short story written about this kid who has this other little boy who kind of follows him around and is his shadow which ultimately ends up being his sexual identity and kind of the the crisis of coming to terms with that and i resonated very deeply with the story so both of those podcasts we will of course be be broadcasting and giving them shout outs as those episodes drop. I haven't checked out uh Fudgel Cast yet, but yeah, Monsters Out of the Closet is a lot of fun and yeah, I like we we've done stuff with them before. We did the uh, our watch party for Krampus way, way back at the beginning of us making this podcast with them and yeah, they've they've always been great supporters, so shout out to both of them these great podcasts i'm staying spooky uh, i've been reading a lot of uh horror literature because i, I want to get back into that mode 
I mean, I, I always read it, but you know, I, 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 I've been turning it into high gear for the last uh, couple of weeks. I just finished White is for Witching, uh, and right now I'm reading uh, Clown in a Cornfield by uh, Adam Cesare. Cesar? But yeah, uh, Clown in the Cornfield, or, or Clown in a Cornfield is like a, it's technically YA, but it's it's basically like a retro slasher about a clown murdering lots of kids in a cornfield. Um, it's pretty great uh, so far, and I'm having fun with it. And then I'm going to uh, also be reading uh, Turn of the Screw next. I've read it a couple of times, but it, it never sticks in my head for some reason. But I definitely want to read it again just before uh, Haunting of Bly Manor drops in a couple of weeks because Haunting of Bly Manor. Enough said. Uh, yeah. 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 So excited. That trailer. Oh, I'm so excited. Everyone, just watch it when it comes out. October 9th. All right. Well, I think that is it. So if there's nothing else to say, stay spooky, friends. And don't get eaten by sharks. Stay spooky. (laughs) need even more scream kings here's our obligatory shameless social media plug follow us on twitter or instagram at scream kings pod you could also email us at scream kings podcast at gmail.com help us reach a wider audience of horror fans by leaving a review on itunes or by sharing a link on social media you can also support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash scream kings stay spooky